In the spring of 1967, following close to a decade of relative calm, Israel found itself poised for war against four of its Arab neighbors. The United States tried to prevent the war through negotiations, but it was not able to persuade Nasser or the Arab states to cease their belligerent statements and actions. Still, right before the war, Johnson warned, Israel will not be alone unless it decides to go alone. Then, when the war began, the State Department announced, Our position is neutral in thought, word, and deed. Moreover, while the Arabs were falsely accusing the United States of airlifting supplies to Israel, Johnson imposed an arms embargo on the region. France, Israel's other main arms suppliers, also embargoed arms to Israel. By contrast, the Soviets were supplying massive amounts of arms to the Arabs. Simultaneously, the armies of Kuwait, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq were contributing troops and arms to the Egyptian, Syrian, and Jordanian fronts. On June 5, 1967, Israel was indeed alone, but its military commanders had conceived a brilliant war strategy. The entire Israeli Air Force, with the exception of just 12 fighters assigned to defend Israel's airspace, took off at 7.14 a.m. with the intent of bombing Egyptian airfields while the Egyptian pilots were eating breakfast. In less than two hours, roughly 300 Egyptian aircraft were destroyed. A few hours later, Israeli fighters attacked the Jordanians and Syrians' air forces as well as the airfields in Iraq. By the end of the first day, nearly the entire Egyptian and Jordanian air forces and half of the Syrians had been destroyed on the ground. The battle then moved to the ground and some of history's greatest tank battles were fought between Egyptian and Israeli armor in the tough conditions of the Sinai Desert. Despite all pre-war prognostications, by the time the war ended, the territory under Israeli control had tripled in size. Jews returned to sites where their ancestors had lived for thousands of years, sites from which waves of terror were launched against them for so many years. The casualties and losses were painful, but minimal in comparison to all projections. The Jewish nation was miraculously victorious in the face of unbelievable odds. History books speak of the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, and many other long-fought battles. Here, in a matter of six short days, a nation managed to utterly root not one, but four powerful enemies. Jews across the globe thank God for the great miracles that happened, an incredible sense of pride and spiritual awakening gripped the Jewish people worldwide. The Six Days War ended up with Israel quadrupling its territory. This is an unprecedented victory. Nowhere at no time in the history of planet Earth a country ever quadrupled its territory within such a short time. The problem was that we stole the glory and the honor from God Himself, who gave us that victory. In spite of all the terrible mistakes made by generals and commanders on the ground, and throughout unbelievable miracles on the battleground, by the time this war ended, the generals received all the honor and the glory. It is the horses and the chariots that the people of Israel started trusting and not God Himself. That climate of pride and arrogance was a very dark time in the history of Israel. We became so boastful and arrogant that we did not even believe our own new ally, King Hussein, who privately came all the way to warn Golda Meir against the coming attack from Syria and Egypt. As early as July 1, 1967, Egypt began shelling Israeli positions near the Suez Canal. On October 21, 1967, 
Egypt sank the Israeli destroyer Eilat, killing 47, amongst them my uncle Yosef, who died on his 19th birthday. Less than a year later, Egyptian artillery began to shell Israeli positions along the Suez Canal. Nasser believed that because most of Israel's army consisted of reserves, it could not withstand a lengthy war of attrition. He believed Israel would be unable to endure the economic burden and the constant casualties would undermine Israeli morale. The bloody war of attrition lasted roughly three years. Israel lost 15 combat aircraft, most shot down by anti-aircraft guns and missiles. The Israeli death toll between June 15, 1967 and August 8, 1970 was 1,424 soldiers and more than 100 civilians. Another 2,000 soldiers and 700 civilians were wounded. The Bible says in Psalm 20, verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And unfortunately, we as a nation trusted our horses and chariots and did not remember the name of our God. And soon enough, and sure enough, the blow came and we were attacked on the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, October 6, 1973, the Yom Kippur War. The 1973 Arab-Israel War, also known as the Yom Kippur War because it began on Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, lasted approximately four weeks. It was October 6, 1973, which also happened to fall that year during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. An Arab coalition led by Egypt and Syria launched a joint surprise attack against Israel the Jordanians decided not to participate. For Israel, the difference between having to fight a war on two fronts instead of three was a meaningful one and gave her a fighting chance. One might have thought that the observance of Yom Kippur would have made it harder for Israel to gather her reserve forces, but it actually was easier in many ways. As it was Yom Kippur, most of the country was at home or in synagogue fasting. This too proved to be miraculous because it was easier to locate the reservists for the sudden draft. Although most people were not listening to the radio and very few had phones at home at that time, a few well-placed calls and gathering of buses in public areas facilitated the call to action. The quiet of the day also allowed reservists to hear the rumbling of the buses and many went to check what was happening. One event, which has been repeated literally thousands of times, concerned Commander David Yini. He was in the process of pulling his troops out of a confrontation with the Syrian army when he realized that they were trapped in a minefield. Knowing it would take a miracle for them to, to make it out alive, the troops began crawling on their bellies while using their bayonets to try and find the mines without setting them off. At some point, one of the soldiers uttered a heartfelt prayer. As the story goes, all of a sudden, a windstorm blew in. The soldiers hunkered down until the storm subsided. And when it did, it had blown away so much of the dirt that the mines were exposed and the entire platoon managed to escape unharmed. In the end, due to a numerous of similar occurrences, not unlike those of previous wars, Israel managed to emerge victorious in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. The attempts to destroy Israel and to put an end to our very existence in this part of the world never ceased. Israel has long sought a peaceful northern border, but Lebanon's position as a haven for terrorist groups has made it impossible. In March of 1978, the PLO terrorists infiltrated Israel. After murdering an American tourist walking nearby an Israeli beach, they hijacked a civilian bus. 
The terrorists shot through the windows as the bus traveled down the highway. When Israeli troops intercepted the bus, the terrorists opened fire. A total of 34 hostages died in the attack. In response, Israeli forces crossed into Lebanon and overran terrorist bases in the southern part of the country, pushing the terrorists away from the border. The Israel Defense Forces, IDF, withdrew after two months, allowing United Nations forces to enter. But the UN troops were unable to prevent terrorists from re-infiltrating the region and introducing new and more dangerous arms. Israeli strikes and commander raids were unable to stem the growth of this PLO army. The situation in Galilee became intolerable as the frequency of attacks forced thousands of residents to flee their homes or spend large amount of time in bomb shelters. Israel was not prepared to wait for more deadly attacks to be launched against its civilian population before acting against the terrorists. On June 6, the IDF moved into Lebanon to drive out the terrorists in Operation Peace for Galilee. The initial success of the Israeli operation led officials to broaden the objective to expel the PLO from Lebanon and induce the country's leaders to sign a peace treaty. In 1983, Lebanon's president Amin Jumail signed a peace treaty with Israel. A year later, Syria forced Jumail to renege on the agreement. The war then became drawn out as the IDF captured Beirut and surrounded Yasser Arafat and his guerrillas. By mid-June, Israeli troops had surrounded 6,000 to 9,000 terrorists who had taken up positions amid the civilian population of West Beirut. The Lebanon war provoked intense debate within Israel. For the first time in Israel's history, a consensus for war did not exist. Prime Minister Menachem Begin resigned as demands for an end to the fighting grew louder. The national coalition government that took office in 1984 decided to withdraw from Lebanon, leaving behind a token force to help the South Lebanese army patrol a security zone near Israel's border. Though the IDF succeeded in driving the PLO out of Lebanon, it did not end the terrorist threats from that country. The war was also costly. 1,216 soldiers died between June 5, 1982 and May 31st of 1985. Israel pulled all its troops out of southern Lebanon on May 24, 2000, ending a 22-year military presence there. All Israel Defense Force and southern Lebanese army outposts were evacuated. The Israeli withdrawal was conducted in coordination with the UN and constituted an Israeli fulfillment of its obligation under Security Council Resolution 425. False charges of Israeli atrocities and instigation from the mosques played an important role in starting the Intifada. On December 6, 1987, an Israeli was stabbed to death while shopping in Gaza. One day later, four residents of the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza were killed in a traffic accident. Rumors that the four had been killed by Israelis as a deliberate act of revenge began to spread among the Palestinians. Mass rioting broke out in Jabalia on the morning of December 9th, in which a 17-year-old youth was killed by an Israeli soldier after throwing a Molotov cocktail at an army patrol. This soon sparked a wave of unrest that engulfed the West Bank, Gaza and Jerusalem. Over the next week, rock throwing, blocked roads and tire burning were reported throughout the territories. By December 12, six Palestinians had died and 30 had been injured in the violence. The following day, rioters threw a gasoline bomb at his U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem. No one was hurt in a bombing. In Gaza, rumors circulated that Palestinian youth wounded by Israeli soldiers were being taken to an army hospital near Tel Aviv and finished off. Another rumor claimed Israeli troops poisoned the water reservoir in Khan Yunis. A UN official said these stories were untrue. Only the most seriously injured Palestinians were taken out of the Gaza Strip to treatment, and in some cases, this probably saved their lives. The water was also tested and found to be uncontaminated. 
The Intifada was violent from the start. During the first four years of the uprising, more than 3,600 Molotov cocktails attacked, 100 hand grenade attacks, and 600 assaults with guns or explosives were reported by the Israeli Defense Forces. The violence was directed at soldiers and civilians alike. During this period, 16 Israeli civilians and 11 soldiers were killed by Palestinians in the territories. More than 1,400 Israeli civilians and 1,700 Israeli soldiers were injured. Approximately 1,100 Palestinians were killed in clashes with Israeli troops. On September 28, 2000, the Likud leader Ariel Sharon went to visit the Temple Mount, Judaism's holiest place, which Muslims have renamed Haram al-Sharif and regard as Islam's third holiest place. Since that time, Palestinians have engaged in a violent insurrection that has been dubbed as Al-Aqsa Intifada. On May 22, 2001, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon declared a unilateral ceasefire in an effort to calm the situation and in the hope that Palestinians would reciprocate by ending their violent attacks against Israelis. Instead, the Palestinians intensified the level of violence directed particularly at Israeli civilians. Yasser Arafat did nothing to stop or discourage the attacks. More than 70 attacks were recorded in the next 10 days during which Israel held its fire from having any retaliation. The campaign of Palestinian terror during the Israeli ceasefire culminated with a suicide bombing at Tel Aviv Disco June 1st that killed 20 people and injured more than 90, mostly teenagers. In the face of the overwhelming international pressure generated by the horrific attack and the fear of an Israeli counterattack, Arafat finally declared a ceasefire. It was not until after September 11, 2001, bombing of the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, that Arafat began to take serious measures to stop the violence by arresting terrorists and using his police force to prevent attacks. The Second and Lebanon War was a month-long conflict between Israeli and Hezbollah forces in Lebanon during the summer of 2006. Instigated when Hezbollah guerrillas conducted a perfidious cross-border raid in which they killed eight Israeli Defense Forces soldiers and abducted two others, the war led to heavy losses on both sides of the conflict and an ultimately inconclusive result. The fighting ended on August 14 with the signing of a United Nations brokered ceasefire and the war was officially ended when Israel lifted its naval blockade of Lebanon on September 8, 2006. In total, Israel lost 121 soldiers, including two kidnapped soldiers, with more than 600 injured, and had 44 civilians killed with nearly 1,500 injured. Though estimates vary, Israel claimed to have killed more than 600 Hezbollah fighters. Throughout the wars, hundreds of rockets landed in open fields, and miracles were recorded where families just left houses or living rooms and a rocket would fall and destroy that very area where they've been minutes before. When the Islamic Party Hamas won the January 2006 Palestinian legislative election, gaining a majority of seats in the Palestinian Legislative Council, the conflict between Israel and Gaza intensified. Israel sealed its borders with Gaza Strip largely preventing free flow of people and many imports and exports. Palestinians have been shooting Qassam rockets at Israeli settlements located near the Gaza border and have staged cross-border raids aimed at killing or capturing Israeli soldiers. In one such raid on June 25, 2006, Palestinian captured Israeli soldier Gilad Shali, leading to massive retaliation by the Israeli army which included airstrikes against Hamas targets. In June 2007, internal fighting broke out between Hamas and Fatah, and the Hamas fully consolidated its power by staging an armed coup and taking control of the Gaza Strip. Following the intense fighting that occurred between 7 and 15 June 2007, 
also known as the Battle of Gaza 2007, in which 118 Palestinians were killed and over 550 were wounded, the entire Gaza Strip came under full control of Hamas government. Since Hamas takeover, Palestinian armed groups in Gaza and Israel continued to clash. Palestinian armed groups have fired rockets into Israel, killing Israeli civilians, including children, and wounding others, as well as causing damage to infrastructure. This unbearable situation led Israel to three different military campaigns in the past five years. Operation Cast Lead between 2008 and 2009, Operation Pillar of Defense in 2012, and last, in the summer of 2014, Operation Protective Edge was launched in order to eliminate a new but deadly source of danger to Israel, the tunnels that were dug by Hamas from the Gaza Strip into Israeli territories. More than 30 different tunnels were destroyed within the next 50 days of combat. At first it was the Iraqi regime in the 1970s that got the uh, French help to build a nuclear reactor. Weeks before that reactor became active, Israel launched an airstrike that destroyed the reactor on the ground and put an end to the efforts to bring a nuclear catastrophe over this part of the world. Shortly after, the Iranians decided that this is the right time for them to start their own nuclear program, learning the lesson from the Iraqi nuclear site that was destroyed, they decided to spread their nuclear sites all around so it will be way more difficult for anyone to destroy it in one wave of airstrikes. The nuclear program of Iran is still a hot topic up until today. World governments are trying to achieve somewhat a compromise that will allow Iran to continue produce uranium in a lower grade. However, Israel is still warning the whole world that Iran is deceiving and Iran is planning something completely different. Under the nose of the intelligence of most of the Western world, Syria, with the help of Iran and North Korea, started building its own nuclear site in Deir Azur, in the desert. Israel launched in 2006 its most advanced satellite, Amos. And when footage came from that satellite, it was evident that something terrible is going on in the Syrian desert. Ships coming from North Korea, carrying supposedly agricultural equipment and materials, unloaded stuff on trucks that was taken directly to the middle of the desert. Time was running short, and Israel decided to send a team of Mossad agents to Europe, to the hotel room of the head of the Syrian nuclear program. Out of his laptop, valuable information was taken. And once analyzed in Tel Aviv, it was evident that the Syrians are indeed deep in the effort of constructing a nuclear reactor. Israel could not afford to wait any longer, not for an approval of the United States, nor for any other country, and by September of 2007, launched an airstrike that completely destroyed the Syrian nuclear reactor. In conclusion, we see the hand of God all throughout the modern history of Israel. The hand of God in rescuing the remnant from the gas chambers and the death camps in Europe. The hand of God in bringing them back to a land that once was a barren wasteland and now is one of the most fertile grounds in the world. The hand of God in reviving the old forgotten Hebrew language as the only mean of communication between people that come for more than 80 different diasporas. The hand of God in making sure that the efforts to destroy the newborn state will fail. God's hand 
was all throughout the history of Israel as a newborn state. And for the past more than 66 years, God is there. The Bible says that he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. The people of Israel are strong and resilient. The people of Israel have seen the great hand of God in protecting and providing everything they needed. And we're holding on to the promise that God gave to Israel through the prophet Amos in its ninth chapter. And I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Amen.